Kamla. My guest today is Lisa Newman. She grew up in what was known as the Valley of Hearts Delight, but to the rest of us, it is known as Silicon Valley. Before Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley, it was a place filled with orchards, fruit trees, and farm stands, and that's where Lisa grew up. And Lisa is, uh, by profession, a city planner, and she has written a cookbook, which she just released, called For the Love of Apricots. And this is Recipes and Memories of Santa Clara County. Welcome. Thank you, Kamla. So this is what you grew up in. So here are some postcards <laughs> that you got for us. This is uh, the sunny uh, Garden of California, Santa Clara County. So these are the kinds of places that you pass by. Yes, even when I was a child, you could see vistas like that. That, of course, harks back a little earlier to the early 1900s, that okay. photograph. And you came here? In 1960. Okay, and first, you came to Saratoga. Yeah, first to San Francisco for a year, and then to the Santa Clara Valley. Okay, so Santa Clara Valley, like I said, we know it as Silicon Valley. Yes, right? but you know, I don't think that's technically a real name. <laughs> How it's not on maps, let's just put it that way. When you grew up, you rode on horses, you had narrow two-lane streets. That's true. And I believe Highway 101 had traffic lights? Yes, it was a highway, you know, not a freeway. And so it did have intermittent stops. That's true. Okay. So paint us a picture in 1960 when you came here. What did you see? What was it like? Well, to be fair, first we came to San Jose, to the neighborhood of Willow Glen. And so we lived there for a few years in a new subdivision. Uh, that had been carved out of a walnut orchard. So this was my first encounter with the change. And we had huge walnut trees in our front and backyards. But we didn't live there very long and moved up to Saratoga, where we had a much larger property and an orchard. Uh, it was, as I found out later in writing this book, it was a remnant of once the largest French prune orchard in the world. This is a postcard. Yes, that postcard is a picture of it. It was the Glen Una Ranch, and it was 680 acres. So growing up there, I didn't recognize or know about that uh, illustrious past, but um, it was still a beautiful, verdant place to be a child and explore and, and learn about the seasons. And uh, we had beautiful views up to the Santa Cruz Mountains and the Santa Clara Valley below. It was really extraordinary. And all around there were orchards. And so, if, so if you stepped out, you were just greeted by trees? Yes, trees everywhere. There were um, large parcels everywhere around us and most of them had fruit trees if not you know real orchards and then you didn't have to go very far beyond our neighborhood to find commercial orchards still in production. So I just uh, while researching for uh, this interview I found out that Steven Spielberg went to the same high school as you did. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know him personally but um, yes it's true and and Steve Jobs you know grew up in Palo Alto and uh, remembered, had a deep, deep fondness for apricots and remembered the apricot trees growing up around his property to the extent that when he planned and designed his new campus, which I got to visit yesterday uh, on a conference with the Rare Fruit Growers Association, um, he made sure that there would be apricot orchards included. So w while we say that we know this area as Silicon Valley today, um, a couple of prominent tech folks have not forgotten uh, the uh, orchard tradition it's and true. the agricultural tradition. You mentioned Steve Jobs. Yeah. Apparently, apple is named after the fruit apple. Yes, that's you know? correct. Yeah. And the Macintosh is also, I think you mentioned, it's one of the varieties of apple. It is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the other person was Hewlett Packard. Yes. Yes, Stanford played a huge role in the transformation of the Santa Clara Valley to the Silicon Valley, and I had the pri privilege to go to school there. Uh, so I was kind of of that era where those changes were happening. But uh, Fred Turman and David Packard and uh, William Hewlett were all students there in the engineering department and you know, moved on to become founders of the tech revolution. They founded the original startup. They did. So, yeah. But they didn't forget the uh, agriculture tradition of the valley. No, they didn't. In fact, today, uh, one of the large remaining orchards is owned by the Packard Foundation. And the children of David Packard are on that board, of course. Okay. And that's in Los Altos. In Los Altos, uh, which is uh, south of, uh, not south, it's, uh, it's north. It's, Los Altos is a bit north and the, in, in the hillsides where this orchard is located. It's east of, it's west of Stanford. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, and you, you mentioned you went to the Apple, new Apple camp, I did. Uh, campus. I did. Did you the see? first public tour you yesterday. Did. It was so exciting. Uh, well, what was, did you see any trees? Did you, did you, have they paid homage to the orchard? They have. I mean, it's, it's a forest right from the start. It's amazing. I'm in, yeah, it, with a focus on oak trees, but there is a, an, an apple orchard uh, with many, many varieties, and the apples are on the tree right now. And then there's an apricot orchard, and he planted um, the traditional variety from the Santa Clara Valley, the Blenheim. Huh. Uh, so they're all Blenheim apricots, and uh, they look very healthy. The trees look wonderful. Before we go to the book and talk about mm -hmm. apricots, you had a poem in your book, which yes. was very delightful, and this is by Claire Louise Lawrence, and she yes. wrote it in 1927. That's correct. How yeah. did you discover the poem? You know, it was in researching um, historical information for the book. It was uh, not something that was recited in schools or that I knew as a child, but uh, it was so sweet, and it really evokes what the valley was like, you know, for generations of people. So do you want to read that I'd out? I'd be delighted, yeah. It was so lovely, I included it in the book. It's called The Valley of Heart's Delight. The Santa Clara Valley is to those who hold it dear, a veritable paradise each season of the year. One loves it best in April when fruit trees are in bloom and a mass of snowy blossoms yield a subtle, sweet perfume. When orchard after orchard is spread before the eyes with the whitest of white blossoms neath the bluest of blue skies, no brush could paint the picture, no pen describes the sight that one can find in April in the Valley of Heart's Delight. So truly it was a very uh, delightful place. She was not the only one to describe it that way. There were lots of um, you know, travelers who wrote about their journeys around the world who took the time to write about the Santa Clara Valley because it was unique around the world. Unique why? For the vastness of the orchards, 125 square miles in spring in blossom, you know, and uh, that led to famous celebrations. In 1900, the Saratoga Blossom Festival was born, and um, it was just founded kind of on a lark by a local minister out of appreciation that there was going to be a good harvest after a few years of drought. And so they just spread the word, and at that time in 1900, there were, you know, railways, but they were more regional. And so the word spread, and with horse buggies, the Saratogans went down to Las Gatas to meet people who were arriving by train. Uh, and they were overwhelmed by the response. And from there, it grew and grew and grew and continued until World War II. And at its peak in the 1920s, um, they reported that there were 20,000 people that attended the Blossom Festival. And it was known throughout the world. So it was that famous? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and people knew around the world about the wonders of the Santa Clara Valley. So the reason that the valley was known for its orchards is it has something to do with the gold rush and yes. World War II, sandwiched between. Yes, yes. I mean, I would say, and in the book I have little essays woven through the recipes, but um, there's, there was really a period of 100 years, you know, from the, from the gold rush um, until the war, World War II that it flourished. And... Uh, there were many factors that came together uh, to make that happen, but certainly um, the gold rush was a profound one. Um, and then the need to feed the miners and to supply them uh, was a big economic driver. Uh, and, and it was quickly discovered that fruit orchards flourished and did so well here because of the year-round great climate, but you know, incredibly long growing season the um, very gentle climate and the um, abundance of water. So it was just so simple to grow fruits that were really pretty extraordinary. And then of course, you know, the development of the railway system allowed those fruits to be transported far and wide. So Lawrence uh, Road, mm -hmm. I, I believe there was a railway station, a, yes. a, a train Lawrence line. Station Road, it was called. Yeah, and it was Do you remember? Two, two lanes. <laughs> Do you remember? Yes. yes. Okay, because the Apple campus is off of Lawrence, mm -hmm. right? It's That's on correct. off of Homestead Road, I want to say. Right. The new campus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you remember in your mind's eye when you go, when you come back to this area, what are the pictures that come up? I, I'm sure it's not Kaiser Permanente and all the startup yeah. companies that yeah. are there. Well, it was certainly true when I was a child that people still came to the region for the blossoms. And, you know, so it, there was still enough in existence post-war um, to, to appreciate it. You know, it wasn't this vast 
uh, unbroken landscape of orchards and blossoms, but it was still predominantly that way. And so it was really, really enjoyable. And, and you just, I have to say, as a child, you kind of took it for granted. It was just part of life. It was the fabric of the landscape. And, you know, there's also the Santa Cruz Mountains and um, the East Bay foothills. So you were, it was framed by these lovely mountains and uh, there were just beautiful views in every direction. But you probably were not aware that you were living a transition, that is. No, not then. No, it really wasn't until the 70s, you know, when I was maturing in high school and college that I really started to recognize and, and personally feel the loss. Is that why you went to Stanford to study what you did? Yeah, well, to be honest, I, I didn't quite know, you know, entering Stanford exactly what I wanted to do, but I had that sense, and it was, you know, coinciding with the environmental movement, which was born in the 70s, that something was being lost, something was wrong, and I guess as a young person, I wanted to try to right that wrong, and it turned out there was a program at Stanford that really suited me well, and it was called Land Resources Planning. How appropriate in some ways, <laughs> right? It was really great good fortune for me. Uh, it suited me well, and it was created by... Um, Erwin Remsen in the Earth Sciences Department, and he partnered with a, a well-known planner from Portola Valley, George Mader, and they dreamed up this program, and it uh, was a fascinating hybrid of disciplines. So I was, again, reading up, because you had mentioned during our uh, pre-interview conversation, mm -hmm. uh, Dorothy Erskine. You yes. Know. So I guess in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, there was a lot of conversation in San Francisco and a lot of uh, activism around homelessness and how the city should be planned and mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. So when you went to school, probably it all culminated. It's true. You know, there were these leaders in the region, um, intellectual leaders, and um, eventually I went to Berkeley to get my master's degree in city and regional planning. And the man who created that program, um, Jack Kent, had been the first uh, planning director for the city of San Francisco. And um, so he was, and then later I, I, I worked for this environmental group called People for Open Space, which he helped found, and Dorothy Erskine was on the board. And so there, they were th these regional thought leaders that were engaged in that. So it looks like it was embedded without you knowing that yeah. this, you know, this. Um, fascination for land, how uh, cities plan and mm -hmm. how land is appropriated. So how surprised were you that it took you so long to kind of get all those threads together and come out to this book? Well, it is, it's a good question and, and it wasn't really done with a great sense of um, planning. <laughs> it was a bit of an epiphany um, that came at a point in life where I had you know, begun to revisit Saratoga with frequency to care for my elderly parents and um, rediscovered old friends uh, that I had grown up with through a reunion and uh, recognized that in Saratoga, my hometown, there was one remaining orchard, a commercial family farm. And, uh, and that is? Novakovich Orchard on Fruitvale Avenue. How appropriate. Appropriately named. And this, this, the, at that, when I was growing up, it was a two-lane road all the way to my middle school. And I would bicycle down you know, from my home to middle school, passing their farm every day. OK. So it was you were taking care of your parents, and all the old memories were rekindled. It's true. And um, we had, uh, you know, in the course of life, my parents had sold our family home. And so that was, you know, a personal, you know, sense of loss of a certain kind, you know, that coincided with the regional, the, my feeling of loss about the region and its change. Um, but it was fortunate that uh, Novakovich was still there. And so I used to take my father there and we would just walk through the orchard and chat with the Novakovich sons who I grew up with and, you know, pet their dog and buy their apricots and you know it was a very comforting and and um, oppor experience and opportunity to remember that way of life um, why were you drawn to the apricot well I th it's my favorite fruit I, th I think it's so beautiful and I think it has a lot to do with the size of it it's just you know fits in the palm of your hand and 
you break it open and you pop it in your mouth. You don't have to peel it. You know, it's um, it's just a delightful fruit. And the traditional variety, the Blenheim, has what uh, I learned at this conference this weekend, a, a term I hadn't known before, the what used to be a prized value, you know, throughout the generations, and it's something I think we've lost touch with, and it's just simply called high flavor. And it's written in all the pomological, you know, histories of throughout time as a value that people understood and appreciated. And it's simply that you get this great balance of sweetness and acidity, and, and then perfume. And the Blenheim has that. And don't um, fruit growers have some sort of a measure, a bricks, bricks measure yes, or something? Yes, that's how they measure the sugar. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so if the sugar content is high, then do you automatically think it's a good fruit? Well, that's a part of the puzzle, right? We, we all want sweet fruits, but it's more tantalizing when it's balanced with acid in just the right proportion. And that is what the apricot is. Sometimes has. things are just too sweet, and it's, it's nice, but it's maybe a little boring. You know, the acid gives it a little bit of interest, and so that's high flavor. <laughs> so, so the, the, so, so the, the uh, apricot is a high flavor fruit? Well, certain varieties, and the Blenheim is one of them. There's also Moor Park. Yeah, and Moor Park was a traditional variety grown in the valley. Uh, Alameda Hemskirk, which is quite a name, uh, was another. And fortunately, there are innovators in the field today who are continuing to find and develop new varieties that have high flavor. Like who? Like, well, George Bonisich, for one, who created the Bonnie Royal just 10, 15 years ago, and it's now available locally. Uh, it's an extraordinary fruit. Where is he located? He lives in um, Gilroy. So which is personally still in part Santa Clara of Valley. Okay. Yeah, in the South End, and there's still quite a bit of agriculture down there, and a lot of apricots. Okay, so you, so uh, what was the role that apricot or apricots played in the economy of uh, this region? That's a great question. So um, it was the number one producer in the world, the Santa Clara Valley, back in the era of the Valley of Hearts Delight, and. Um, so the between the, World War One and two, yes, and even before World War One, but you know from the 1880s oh. until World War Two, and um, the the number one fruit was the French prune, uh, and there were eight eight hundred thousand no excuse me there are eighty thousand acres of apricots in the 1920s in the Santa Clara Valley, today there's less than eight hundred acres, um, there were six hundred sixty five thousand trees back then of apricots. And there were millions of... Um, other fruit trees. Of, well, millions of other fruit trees, but there were millions of French prunes. Oh. It, it was just extraordinary. So it formed the backbone of this, uh, the economy of this oh, place. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And today apricots are probably... It uh, doesn't even get really onto the, the ledger. You know, it's, it's very, it's a specialty crop nowadays. I see uh, apricots or apricots from Turkey. Yes. In, yes. in, in my in, neighborhood. Yes, they're widely available. They're very inexpensive. And to my taste, they're not worth the money. <laughs> they're just kind of flavorless. What, what? And when you have an alternative in the region, you know, I far prefer that. And I think this fruit was a much prized fruit in yes. through the ages. Yes, it's true. Yeah, apricots, you know, made a very long, slow migration from the east, from let's say China. That's what a lot of people say, although it's kind of you know in the mists of time, not that clear. Um, very slowly to the west, and the western terminus was the Santa Clara Valley, where ah. really it, people say it found its perfect home. Right here, mm -hmm. because of the microclimate yes. and the topsoil and yes, everything. Yes, exactly right. Okay, so now it's at the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> you know, we don't see Sadly. it anymore. We don't see it, excepting you know there's a Moore Park Avenue in San Jose. Oh, yeah, it's, there are names that remind us of our history. Yeah, that's true. Does it remind you when you drive down? Well, yes, it does. You know, Fruitvale Avenue, I'm so glad it's still there, and it's still two lanes for a good portion of it. It really holds a lot of memories for me because parts of it have not really changed that much. And they still have that little heritage orchard. Yeah, that's really good to bring up because along the years with all the loss of orchards, some communities had the forethought to set aside what they call heritage orchards. So Saratoga did, Los Altos, Sunnyvale, uh, San Jose. Uh, and, you know, it's reminders to the public of what our heritage was and, and still an opportunity for the fruit to be cultivated and enjoyed.
And you grew some some trees back in your home in uh, Marin County. I do. I have my mini orchard of three apricot trees. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, back in the day, um, fruit was largely grown and canned or dried and shipped for enjoyment around the world. Um, so the Dole because Company and Sunsweet, they all, Mariani, they're all from yeah. here. Yes, the, at the peak, there were, it, there was, that was a huge ancillary industry, canning and um, warehousing uh, of fruit. So the reason that it wasn't fresh marketed so much was because in a more rural era, era people had their own fruit trees. And as one of the orchardists, Charlie Olson, t said to me, um, you just, one fruit tree will feed a family for a year, so. And you probably didn't buy us a kid because- No, were, in the, fact, we would take our extra fruit and rock and go down to the highway and, and sell it. <laughs> oh, which highway? <laughs> highway 9, Saratoga Los Gatos okay. Road. It's, yeah. it's more like a- It's a regional road, it's not a highway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, so people would buy? Yeah, sure. You know, we were, my little brothers were cute and blonde. and. <laughs> So you would buy. So uh, let's come to the book. So you got this idea to write the book, For the Love of Apricots, Recipes and Memories of Santa Clara County. And this is in some ways paying homage not only to the valley of Heart's Delight, but also to your parents and especially yes. your mother. Yes. You know, I, I realized, you know, in this era of life, what a great privilege it was to grow up where I did and in the time that I did. And and so there is a sense of uh, deep appreciation for that. And um, my mother was pretty extraordinary cook and took advantage of all the fruits and vegetables that she grew on our property. And um, and so I grew up enjoying fresh, you know, farm to table meals long before that coin that term was coined. And um, so that, you know, the enjoyment of food and cooking has been a lifetime passion for me. So it was um, that little epiphany I had walking through the orchard one winter a few years ago of, huh, you know, I could write a cookbook, but I could talk about the history of the region. And uh, and also, the third thing I think the book does is celebrate what I call the enduring farmers, the ones that are still among us, you know, growing the good fruit. Like the Olsons in Sunnyvale. Yes, right, and Andy Mariani and Morgan Hill and the Novakovich family in Saratoga. There's just a good number of them that have held on right in the middle of Silicon Valley. And of course, there's more as you go further south in Santa Clara Valley. They probably have challenges. They do. There's so many challenges. Uh, does agri-tourism help the farm to? Yes, it does. Uh, what is it? The farm to table movement. Does yes, that help? Yes, absolutely. And some are more, um, you know, outreaching toward that than others. Uh, Andy Mirani is a great example. In the summertime, he has uh, farm tours and tasting events, which draw in thousands of people. And it's really an enjoyable pastime in the summer, and you can pick your own fruit. Um, others just have quieter reputations like the Nabokoviches, but they're still strong. And um, so, yeah, to one degree or another, they do. And I think hopefully that could be a future because a lot of these farms don't necessarily have a succession plan. They don't necessarily have heirs that are going to take over. And with land values being what they are, uh, it would be easy to imagine that they could disappear within our generation. So if you wear your city planner hat, yes. <laughs> um, what are you doing to help these farmers at a policy level? Well, I'm not uh, engaged in that specifically in the Santa Clara Valley because I live and work up in Marin County and that's the focus of my work up there. I do a lot of work uh, in heritage preservation, but more of the architectural kind um, because there isn't in... Uh, Marin County, the, they've done quite a good job of preserving agriculture in the east side of the county, and that was done through their general plan back in the 70s. You know, they established a agriculture corridor to the west, uh, urban development to the east, and they've stuck to that. Um, one of my... We, Is that why we have Marin County, uh, uh, Napa Valley and all... Well, Napa Valley is another good example of a county that got, was an early adapter of good planning principles. And they saved the valley floor for wine production. It used to be orchards, but, oh. but as wine took over, they recognized that if you didn't uh, establish lot sizes that supported agriculture, it was going to be urbanized. So they did that. They set a 60-acre minimum for agriculture in the valley, on the valley floor, and that has held pretty well. And of course, the value of wine grapes as a crop has also supported its survival. Um, Santa Clara County, you know, the forces were so strong 
uh, for the political urbanization. Forces. The political and the economic forces and, and sort of the lack of a vision that we should try to you know, maintain a balance between agriculture, natural you know, amenities like parks and watershed lands and things like that, and urban development. And um, So this was, you're talking about the time you guys moved here. Right. They didn't right. have a plan. And, and I appreciated that more than many because my first job out of college was with this environmental group that we mentioned earlier, and it's that Dorothy Erskine was affiliated with and Jack Kent. Uh, called People for Open Space, and that group has continued on to this day, and now they're called the Greenbelt Alliance. But back then, they were crystallizing this idea that um, citizens should come together, become informed, and advocate to preserve a green belt of open space around the region that would contain urban development in a manner that supported it, so that you would have agriculture, you would have watersheds, you'd have parks, um, you know, all those those aspects for healthy regional living. And um, and so we went around the nine county Bay Area and met with local citizens and drew up maps and, uh, you know, kind of gave them boot camp and uh, political advocacy. And it was a great experience. And it gave me a lot of perspective about what was possible in the region. I read the book and I went through the recipes. What is your favorite recipe? <laughs> Well, some of these are recipes that I've been making for decades. And um, through my training, you know, culinary training and um, the, the mentors that I hold uh, dear, there's some real favorites like the apricot almond tart. To me, to me, that is like the heart of summer. It's a beautiful pastry. Um, it's a little bit more on the advanced side of some of the recipes in the book, but it's completely doable and it's elegant and it's delicious. And and uh, in terms of cocktails, apparently the Valley of Heart, uh, Heart's Delights fruits uh, started this whole cocktail movement I, I read somewhere, the fruit cocktail movement. Well, fruit cocktail was a product of the Valley. That was the canned fruit we all grew up with that had a cherry in it. I'm can. talking about the bar kind of cocktails, <laughs> the ones that you get in bars. Was that uh, uh, inf influenced by the fruits that were grown here? Uh, it could have been. It certainly was also a wine growing region. And so that has been a part of our culture you know, throughout time. Um, but the, uh, yeah, I have some cocktails in there, including a sangria and, um, but also just apricot nectar is a wonderful drink and it's a wonderful base for, you know, a mimosa or other things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I can see you're going through an apricot phase right now. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> now it's, it's, you know, it starts with breakfast and it ends with cocktails. So there's all kinds of fun things in the book. Lisa, it was such a pleasure to talk to you about your book, For the Love of uh, Apricots, Recipes and Memories of Santa Clara County. How do you say apricots, apricots? Ah, uh, I say apricots, and my theory is that's because I'm a Westerner and that people east of the Rockies say apricots. Okay, so <laughs> I'm neither here nor there, so it's apricots. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you, Kamla. And thank you for watching. We'll be back again next week with another conversation. In case you missed any of our shows, you can watch them on our website, kamlashow.com. Until next week, goodbye.